the Canon 5D Mark IV. When the specs were released, I was a little underwhelmed. Now I've been shooting with this camera for about a week and... First, I want to thank Lens Pro to Go. They're an awesome photography and videography rental company with a huge selection, fast shipping, and they're great people that you can actually talk to on the phone when you need to. There's no better way to figure out if a new camera or lens is going to work for you other than actually using it. So I highly recommend you check them out. There's a link right down below. This video is going to be a mix of an early review, a comparison against something like the Sony a7R II, because that's the camera I've been primarily using for the last year. And I'm also going to share the results of a poll I asked you last week. Which would you rather have, the Canon 5D Mark IV with 24 to 70 f2.8 or the Sony a7R and the Sony 24 to 70 f2.8. Now, you know, despite the Canon 5D Mark III being my primary camera for several years, and I shot more photos with that than any other camera ever, I never actually did a review. So, my review of the 5D Mark III, it's a fantastic camera. The ergonomics, the quality, the fact that I could shoot weddings, events, as well as create gorgeous 1080p video for this channel starting back in 2012, it was really a sweet camera. It served those two purposes very well and was absolutely the best purchase I could have made then. Now, the 5D Mark IV does not continue that trend. It's the video. There's absolutely no way I can recommend this camera to anyone that wants to shoot video seriously. Some of you say, of course, it's a primarily a stills camera, get a camcorder. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. But again, the 5D Mark III, it broke ground in providing awesome video quality, along with being an amazing stills machine. And it is used and loved by a large number of videographers. But as more of those videographers want or need 4K, it's unlikely that they're gonna upgrade. The ancient codec Canon chose to use, plus the 1.64x crop at 4K, makes it clear that Canon does not want to continue creating hybrid cameras and would rather videographers spend much more on their high-end cinema line, which is excellent, but extremely expensive. And that's sad. You can, of course, create, create gorgeous video with this camera. I'm not denying that. Just the fact that I can actually get full frame 4K in better low light quality from a Sony, plus that Super 35, which is fantastic, and it's stabilized, or spend a third of the price and get the GH4 with arguably better video features. Cameras that are one and two years old respectively, again, it's just a little sad. But let's set that sadness aside and talk about this camera as a photographer's tool. And in that category, it is a solid performing camera and represents a decent upgrade to the 5D Mark III. Yes, it is still a touch behind the competitors in terms of image quality. And I use that term, image quality, broadly to reference high ISO performance, dynamic range, detail. I've been comparing it mostly to the Sony a7R II, and it is right there, image quality-wise, at all but the higher ISOs. And when there is a difference, it is quite slight. Uh, but there is still a noticeable difference in just how much you can raise those shadows. The Sony continues to shine here. I'll let you decide if that's a pun. Now you could make a comment about a brand new camera, the 5D Mark IV, being compared to a year old camera. But when I asked you all in the poll which you'd prefer, there were plenty of people that picked the Canon. Hint, it actually won the poll. We'll talk more about that in a second. And not a single one of those people mentioned image quality other than skin tones. This isn't this camera's strength. It isn't the ultimate in resolution and high ISO performance. If you want that, one or the other, you should choose the 5DSR or the Sony a7R II or the Nikon D810 or the Nikon D820 that's not too far away. We'll get more to the future talk in a second. So what is this camera's strength then? Well, usability which has been further improved in the Mark IV with that touch screen. It is very nice. I wish it was articulating. Much better live view focusing, not only because of the touch, but just because that dual pixel autofocus is fantastic. And you've got an additional assignable button on the back now. And that joystick, this isn't new, but that joystick for selecting your focus points, 
make sure you enable it, and having, in my opinion, just a generally a nice balance of physical buttons all within easy reach. And that logical Canon menu, which is further made accessible by the touchscreen. And that very reliable autofocus, including improved low light AF performance. That's great because I was really starting to get pretty jealous of Nikon side of things. And of course, Canon's huge lens selection and that ecosystem in general of gear all built for Canon cameras. These are all strengths. Uh, and of course, we are comparing, if we're comparing to the Sony, the Canon gets a huge win in battery life. Now, some of you in the comments of the poll mentioned reliability and the dual card slots. I will say that my 5D Mark III got a little rained on and had to have the motherboard replaced. So I'll also say that I have accidentally and purposefully pulled out the SD card of the Sony while I was writing. And because that database the Sony creates, I haven't ever lost a file, knock on wood, even the one it was writing when I pulled. It's pretty spiffy. But if shooting a wedding, it does make me feel better to have two cards capturing that data as a bit of added insurance or any event where there are can't miss, can't recreate moments. I'm going to start to wrap up this review and I do want to say something about the appeal of this camera being to a noticeably smaller audience than the 5D Mark III. Those that are video focused, those that needed a strong hybrid camera, those looking for the best resolution and image quality, those were all markets that the Mark III did well with. Does it really matter though? I do just want to say for a long time I've seen the Mark III as one of the most wished for cameras and I just want to make sure as we enter this dawn of a new age, cue dramatic music, that it's not so much the default choice these days for so many as the Mark III was. That said, as I teased, I asked my audience, you here on YouTube I posted, I sent out to my email list, I posted on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and you all did pick the Canon with 24 to 70 over the Sony A7R Mark II with Sony. It was a 60% to 40% split. Now I will say that I think I have a slight channel bias here. Much of my early growth of the audience came from my Canon reviews and tutorials. So there is some bias coming from that I think. But reading the comments, there's this general feeling of Canon being the more reliable workhorse that feels better in the hand and will offer better and more reliable autofocus. I'm not gonna argue with any of that. Uh, paraphrasing the Sony comments, a lot of mentions of the sensor, the fact that it's lighter and more packable with this combination, the Sony actually just about the same. I'll add that for general photography, landscape, and travel, that's mostly what I'm shooting these days, the Sony is easily my pick. Having this articulated screen is fantastic. I can so easily get different angles. Although I really enjoy the usability of the Canon, as soon as I try to shoot at anything other than eye level, I really miss my articulating screen. And if there's one way to kind of set your landscape shots aside from everybody else's, it's to get at a different angle from time to time, a lot of times really low. So that's difficult on the Canon. Of course you can do it. Of course you can lay on the ground, but it's more difficult. And if Nikon can put an articulating screen in their very rugged D500, it could be added to these high-ender Canon cameras as well. And I've now dropped my a7R II twice in the last year. Once the screen was out, and while there's some warping, it doesn't lay quite flat against the body, it does still work fine. I also miss the EVF when I'm shooting with a traditional DSLR these days. Knowing what my photo is gonna look like before I take the picture and in bright sunlight, I've got this aftermarket eye cup on here, being able to review my shots on this completely shaded EVF is excellent. That paired with the in-body image stabilization doesn't mean I need to always bring along a tripod even at those slower shutter speeds, even when using a prime. And that little bit of extra shadow recovery on the Sony side is great. Those are all things, those are all reasons why I personally would pick the Sony walking out the door for general photography. That doesn't mean this camera is perfect. As we've said before, the menu could be so much better. It isn't as quick to operate and bring up to your eye. It does have the full manual controls. I saw some people mention that. It's got dual dials. I don't have a problem with that, but it, there's always a little bit of a hesitation to it and a God help you if you shot a burst and you wanna do anything in the menu. So, and of course your lenses are more expensive, although all of the recent Sony lenses are fantastic. You just will find yourself paying for those. So I do 
find myself still using the Canon lenses with a Sigma adapter, which is working very well. And next week I leave for a photography trip to Scotland and the 5D Mark IV will be coming along, along with the Sony as well. And I'll be sharing some more long-term thoughts, sharing some of my favorite features of the Canon during and after that trip. So make sure you subscribe to follow along to those as well as follow me on Instagram to see what I'm up to between those videos. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe. I've got more 5D Mark IV content coming. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.